There is no question that something is here. Lurking. Somewhere in the darkened corners. But how will we ever find out what it is? We need to look. Always. And never stop. No matter what stands in our way. No matter what others may think. Explore the darkness. Shine light into it. Join the red strings and the silver threads. Everything is connected. Somehow. I am Mark L. Watson. This is Peer Beyond the Veil. My interest in the paranormal generally sort of goes back to probably childhood. Um, I think it was a mixture of two things, really. One is that the subject was, is simply exciting, and the other is a certain degree of intellectual sort of challenge it poses. It would be nice to say it was purely intellectual, but I think there's an emotional aspect as well. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, I, I think probably most people's interests have a kind of emotional component. Otherwise, they'd be pretty dry and dull. Um, but uh, I, you know, I read about this sort of thing as, well, as, as when I was young, did some experiments as I got older and made inquiries, um, became sort of informed. I don't know about well informed, but generally knowledgeable about the area to, to a degree. When I retired from my job, I was able to give more time to it. Um, there was a period actually, maybe around about my 30s, where I actually temporarily sort of dipped out of the area. I think it was partly because I was feeling, I was reading so many reports where studies had found that such and such an experiment had been questioned, there were doubts about this stuff and the other, and it was hard to know without going into enormous detail what was true and what wasn't. I mean, that's still true to some extent. And even though I do believe that paranormal phenomena, if you like, occur, um, I, I still remain quite doubtful about many of the reports that are in circulation and the standards that are, you know, that people adopt in reporting things and the, the way people can be quite credulous about things. Although, as I say, I do believe that things do unusual do happen, but I, I do think there's a kind of a, a lamentable lack of kind of rigor, really, when it comes to ghost accounts, particularly spontaneous cases and so on. Each of us has our beliefs, and most of us have a point where that belief, that faith, that understanding reaches a limit. There are many amongst us, perhaps yourself, who believe in one aspect of the paranormal, but not others. We may believe in the existence of a form of life after death, but draw the line before believing in Bigfoot. Or perhaps we believe in Bigfoot, but only if he's a terrestrial zoological creature, and draw the line somewhere before believing that he's an extraterrestrial. And of course, there are many who don't believe in any of it at all. And by contrast, there are many who believe in virtually all of it. But what makes us believe? What is it that leads us to believe in the existence of the supernatural? Many experiences of the paranormal, those who have seen things or heard things as a one-off incident or on a more frequent basis, speak the truth when they tell their stories. They are not, many of them at least, lying when they say they saw the UFO or spoke with the spirit entity or saw the Sasquatch disappearing into the cave. What they experience is real to them, but it may not be real in the sense that we often regard it. So what is the psychological, sociological, pathological reason for this? Many of us, perhaps too many, approach the wide-ranging fields of paranormal research with a little too much paranormal and too little research. A huge element of subjective belief and influence goes into it all, and as there is often no scientific explanation to support or validate it, science often falls at the wayside. My guest tonight approaches things a little differently. A clinical psychologist by trade with a PhD awarded from the University of Glasgow for his work on hypnosis, Peter McHugh falls on both sides of the aforementioned fence. 
a believer that there are indeed a range of strange unexplained and by virtue paranormal things that occur in our world that are yet beyond the reaches of modern scientific explanation he approaches each case with a well-trained clinical approach the conclusions he draws have seemingly more weight attached to them as a result his books, including Paranormal Encounters on Britain's Roads and Britain's Paranormal Forests, are extensively researched, sources cited in meticulous detail and packed full of the weird and wonderful happenings of our ancient country. It is our great pleasure to welcome Peter to the show to discuss with us a little about what makes us want to peer beyond the veil. I did occasionally in the course of my work, although it, my work wasn't primarily to do with paranormal experiences, I'd come across the odd patient who'd had some sort of bizarre experiences and some of them were quite bizarre, very bizarre. And, um, and it was interesting to talk to them. And I think sometimes they were maybe a bit surprised that I was so accepting of what they had to say, you know, because I think there's a popular image that psychologists are ultra skeptics. I think this is partly because there are sort of renter skeptics that, often the same person will come crop up on the box you know and it will be described as a psychologist and I think that distills into people's mind the idea of psychologist equals ultra skeptic and uh, I don't think that's true at all I mean among my colleagues when I was working um, in the last 10 years for instance you know they, they knew of my interests and they were all pretty open-minded about the subject as well I think officially a clinical the psychology as a profession is probably quite conservative i remember i submitted a, an article to the psychologist which is the house magazine of the british psychological society a while back and it was on missing time experiences essentially and it didn't even get to peer review <laughs> you know it was kicked out by the editor even before going to peer review but it was published somewhere else in the, in the publication of the spr slightly modified i changed it slightly but but it was just, it, 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 I thought, well, official psychology, probably they, they don't think this is acceptable. Mind you, if I'd submitted an article, um, you know, saying that I'd conducted a study and I'd found that people who believed in paranormal phenomena were significantly more neurotic, had a, a lower IQs, uh, were more prone to psychotic tendencies. I wonder whether that might have got through. <laughs> It might have got to peer review, might have even been published, you know, but something suggesting that, you know, people are having bizarre missing time experiences, which actually defy current, current explanations that maybe is going a bit too far. <laughs> the, that, that, that psychologist attitude, the classic attitude that you just described, there is actually at odds with, with how I would see common sense's approach to it, which is actually as, as somebody who works with people with mental health or has worked with people with mental health, you see the bizarre at times things that the human brain can do that it's capable of that the the reality in inverted commas that some of these people live that isn't the reality that we see actually it, it should be researched far more should it not be more accepted by the psychologist community that actually some of these things can Okay, maybe they're not, maybe it's not a real black cat in the woods, but if that is something that the mind is projecting, that it's something, even if it's purely internalized within the human yeah. brain, shouldn't be shunned, should it not? Because it's neurological research that should be done. Exactly. Well, it, it, it sort of interests me the fact that the, the evidence for poltergeist activity seems very strong. Uh, you know, classic cases all across the world, um, many cases involving maybe minor incidents, but still quite perplexing. Um, and yet that's treated as fringe and not proper. But if people get really excited about the uh, Higgs boson, you know, a tiny subatomic particle or something that uh, doesn't really have much direct relevance to our everyday lives. And yet down the road, chairs are flying around by themselves and that is not regarded as worthy of scientific interest. Whereas something obscure costing a fortune, um, you know, like or discovery of some... I'm not saying that that kind of fundamental research in physics is worthless. I'm, I'm not attacking it. I'm just saying the contrast is, is odd. The fact that people would, would want to dismiss or not even not even want to consider um, perhaps because they would feel it be career damaging or something if they kind of showed that they had an interest in poltergeist phenomena. Do you think it's down to the the terms used, the titles given, the names given to this? And, and what I'm hinting at there is 
um, hallucinations of a clinical nature are understood, accepted, researched, documented. But if that is a hallucination of something that we call in a parent of a paranormal nature, it's not. It could be. I mean, I think it, it, it may be that privately people are, are more accepting of these things than they, they would acknowledge publicly. You know, if you're applying for a job and you, you, you're trying to get into a prestigious academic institution where there's a degree of conservatism, if you've got an interest in parapsychology or psychical research, it might, and you're, you're, this is your, the job you're applying for is in psychology, mainstream psychology, rather than, say, parapsychology, it may be that you might play down that interest or not, not acknowledge it for fear that prejudice could count against you the fact that you're not mentioning it doesn't mean that you don't believe in the phenomena or the possibility of those phenomena it could just be that you're being a bit cautious so the whole thing feeds on itself and conservatism continues uh, about this um, the, the question of hallucinations is interesting because um, my my view is and it's not an original idea it's been kicked around for years is that uh, paranormal phenomena may be in to a considerable degree hallucinatory um, if and if you say to someone who says has an experience of seeing a ghost or something like that and you suggest that what they experienced was an hallucination they might sort of tend to take offense thinking that you're you're questioning their um the sanity um but um it, as you probably know, it, it, one view of, of apparition experiences is that they may be both paranormal and hallucinatory. So you might have a group of people who see the same figure. It may have no objective existence, but the, the very fact that different people have seen it at, either at the same time or on different occasions in the same place um, itself is sort of odd. Um, so even if it even if the figure is hallucinatory, it doesn't mean that the that it's not a paranormal phenomenon. But I think that's a problem in trying to get across to people, uh, you know, when you're discussing apparitional experiences. And I also think that could be true with many UFO phenomena that they may many UFO phenomena may may be orchestrated hallucinations. Um, so th therefore I think this idea of things being both hallucinatory and paranormal is worth bearing in mind. Um, I think there's a naive tendency to think that um, you know if two or three people see the same thing it must be objectively real um, but it's quite possible that uh, theoretically that they could have a collective hallucination uh, or it may be a transient materialization or something like that rather than something that uh, a vehicle that continues to exist beyond the experience. Um, I sometimes wonder whether some of these UFO events are, are creations of the moment. They're a kind of drama that's, 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 that's played out and that when the drama ends, the UFO doesn't go somewhere else. It doesn't go into another dimension or to another planet or somewhere like that or into another kind of type of space. It just may cease to exist because it's function has been served it may it may be reactivated at a subsequent time different place even but it may not have a continuous existence um, whereas you know if you think of nuts and bolts terms you'd think well where's it gone it's maybe cloaked itself with some kind of new stealth technology or something like that or as, as i say gone into another dimension or something like that but it just may have you know the drama's over for the day the company has packed up and now off to the pub One of the things about this area that intrigues me is the overlap that you get between different types of phenomena. I mean, traditionally, people who are interested in ghosts and apparitions and so on may not be interested in UFOs and vice versa. But uh, when you actually look at real cases, you sometimes see an overlap. Um, and it may be that if people aren't aware of this overlap, or don't give it sufficient attention, when they're investigating cases, they won't ask the people concerned. Uh, maybe say this is a haunted house type case. They won't bother to ask, have you ever seen a UFO? Or have you ever seen a Bigfoot or strange animals in the area? Um, uh, and yet when you look at certain cases, you see that, that sort of overlap occurring. Um, Bigfoot seen in conjunction with a UFO, um, ghostly phenomena and UFO phenomena kind of intermixed poltergeist phenomena following from a, a UFO experience. So 
Um, you know, I wonder whether these these things do are closely linked, and they they, they may be orchestrations. Uh, I'm not saying that that's the whole explanation. Some places on our planet or within a specific nation or region seem more prone to paranormal incidents. There are places where ghosts are seen with more frequency than the normal, locations where there is maybe a thinning of the veil between this existence and the next. Certain places seem to attract UFOs, the skies in those locations playing out nightly shows of unexplained flickering and flashing lights. Other places where Bigfoot or black cats or dogs or sea serpents are more frequently seen. But what is going on there? Are these places so-called hotspots? Are they places where creatures or entities or extraterrestrials can access our world with more ease? Or is there a more terrestrial or perhaps geological explanation to it? There is evidence that earth tremors releasing large amounts of electromagnetism can lead to hallucinations, physical effects in the body and brain and even cause lights in the sky. Certain other geological anomalies can cause visual and auditory sensations which may appear to be perhaps ghosts or spirits. So the question has many answers and many explanations as to why people experience things with more frequency in certain places than others. So the question has many answers and many explanations as to why people experience things with more frequency in certain places than others. But of course, as always, it only partly explains things. Well, to be honest, I'm, with, with some of these cases, I'm not really sure that there are, they, they, these alleged hotspots are really hotspots. I think there's, you can have a problem with selective reporting. Um, let's imagine, for instance, there's a flurry of, of UFO reports in a certain part of England. Um, and then and it happens that you've got a few enthusiasts or kind of a, a very active investigators based in that, that area who, who write articles and books about it. Um, and the area gets a reputation of, for being a, 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 a hot spot. Um, people then start to go to that area uh, doing sky watches and they still see things that they wouldn't otherwise have noticed because they weren't going to, on sky watches before. So the thing can quickly kind of take on the, the impression of being a hotspot. Um, an example might be I could give is the Pennines, the Pennines, the southern and central Pennines of, of England. I mean, in past years, that was claimed to be a hot spot. But there were a number of quite prominent researchers based in that area um, who gave publicity to the case, to the area. Um, and it, it may be that statistically, if we had, we had the actual data, um, which we don't have, complete data across the whole world or the whole country, um, the, the, the concentration of cases might not be any higher there than, than than elsewhere it may simply be that the the ratio of reported cases to unreported might be might be higher um, and if of course if you live in an area which is dubbed by the press and by commentators as a hot spot you might be more willing to come forward about your own bizarre experiences there because you feel well there are other witnesses have been reporting these things i'm not going to be regarded as an idiot whereas if it's a place that isn't well known for these act these things you may be more reluctant to come forward and the more or there may be fewer people around wanting you to come forward however um, in that first book I, I took the view well even if statistically some of these so-called hot spots aren't any aren't unique or special the the reports from within them are probably worth looking at in their own right they might be actually genuine cases of you know something sort of anomalous ufo activity or paranormal activity uh, and it, even if they don't cluster for more heavily there than anywhere else they're still interesting in their own right a very a classic case that that's, 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 you don't hear about it so much nowadays but uh, years ago where this kind of conflict between was it a really a hot spot or whether it was a social phenomenon was warminster the warminster area in 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 wiltshire um, in the mid 60s it, it acquired a reputation for ufo sightings and people started flocking to the area gathering on the local hills sky watching 
there was a local journalist called Arthur Shuttle, Shuttlewood who wrote a series of books largely about the area, publicizing it. Um, and, you know, quite a number of things were reported. There were also some hoaxes carried out during that time and for over the next sort of 10 years or so. Um, and the skeptics would say, well, what happened at Warminster? It was a kind of, or well, I suppose they might even use the word mass hysteria, you know, or suggestion, imagination, and that kind of thing. The believers would say, well, actually, you know, quite a good number of strange incidents did occur. But it's very hard to know, as I say, without true statistics, without adequate statistical information, whether it was any hotter than anywhere else. Here in Britain, um, a, a, a phenomenon that I've taken interest in over the years is road ghost cases. You know, people driving along um, and they see a figure which runs out in, across the road in front of the vehicle. They hit the brakes and, you know, think they've hit someone or fear they have, get out, check, and then there's no one there. You know, and th th there are lots of cases like that, probably worldwide actually, that have been cases. Are there, um... Are, are any of them looked into further as to whether there was previously fatalities at that spot, whether it's a, a, a replaying of, of an event which had taken case? Have you looked into it? Well, yeah, the, the problem with that is if you look at some of the, the actual cited cases, it's, 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 it's not terribly clear. I mean, there's a road in southern Scotland um, called the A75. And the, oh, well, the, I should say the old A75 and it used to go from Gretna and it used to sort of snake west to Stranra uh, in the sort of far southwest of Scotland. Now on that road over, over decades, there had been a number of reports of, of road ghost phenomena and, and including the figures coming out in front of drivers. But uh, the, the accounts differ quite, quite a bit about what's seen, you know, what sort of figure is seen. Um, in one case, for instance, a couple, a man and a woman, the figures walked out in front of a lorry and when the lorry driver got out angry to remonstrate with them, he couldn't find them. Uh, in other cases, it's just a man, you know, stepping out into the road. Um, so th th it's hard to relate the accounts to a specific incident and then and say, well, it's, it's a replay of such and such. Um, it may be that there are cases of road ghost phenomena where there, there has been an accident, but uh, when you look at the, the, the variation on the kind of apparitional theme uh, with some of the cases, um, it's, it's, it's not, not terribly clear that there's a single originating event. There, there are there are some cases which have a degree of credibility. There's one, as you say, you've caught me. I didn't know you were going to ask me about this, but so I'll, 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 I'll sure forgive me if, if, I, if I get dates and things wrong, but there was a case from, I think it was Bedfordshire, um, of a man coming back from a darts match, and he he picked up a hitchhiker. And when the, the, the hitchhiker got into the vehicle, he didn't seem to say anything. And I think the driver felt this was a bit, maybe maybe even a bit discourteous, I'm not sure, but he, he thought, well, possibly he's deaf and dumb or something, you know. And when, when asked where he wanted to go, the figure just pointed ahead. And at some point, the driver turned to offer the man a cigarette. Uh, suddenly, there was nothing, no one there. And the man was shaken up by the experience and went to a pub, had a stiff whiskey. He was interviewed by, by at least one, one investigator. Um, who wrote a book on phantom hitchhikers and uh, seemed to be, you know, a fairly genuine case. Another uh, researcher uh, called Rob Gandhi, he's looked at an area called Horsall Moss in West Lancashire. And he's come across a number of road ghost reports from there, including ones where people are driving along and they've actually found someone in the car with them. With, with these cases, um, I don't think the, the, the figures were literally hitchhiking, sticking out a thumb. I think it was more a case of either something came into the car or they suddenly found someone in the back seat. There's an area up in the north of Scotland near Inverness, uh, near, near a loch called Loch Ashie, which has been the focus of quite a bit of, well, in past years, reported paranormal activity, um, including sightings of phantom warriors. But there were also reports from the area of a phantom vehicle. And I managed to, to get some first-hand testimony from one person who thought he saw it some years ago. 
Um, and uh, I also read another first-hand account from a chap called Major C.J. Shaw, who, you know, described his driving with his wife and they saw a vehicle t t signaling, I think it was turning into a lay-by or something, and then when they turned the corner or something, there was nothing there. Um, so, you know, maybe some association with a particular place. Tell us about our, uh, our mystical ancient forest. The book is titled Britain's Paranormal Forests, Encounters in the Woods. So the, uh, uh, I mentioned woods and, and forests. It's not just forests. So, uh, but, sure. uh, but, uh, but, so that's my excuse in case people kind of criticise me for not having enough forests. <laughs> and the, but um, but I, I, I've, I've always been, I like woodland. It's sort of personal thing, you know, and I, you know, I find something kind of romantic and attractive about woodland, particularly broadleaf woodland. And I have read quite a few reports reports of, of, of uh, I'd heard of reports of experiences in the woods of one sort or another so I thought I'd put together a, a book on that and uh, so I've looked I've looked at a series of areas in some depth and then there's another chapter where I look more briefly at, at reports and some of them are you know as, as I admit and I even label the categories such some of them are, are, are more on the kind of a folklore end of things you know where where you, you know, it's, it's a bit doubtful whether you know how how much to, reality is to the stories you know when you, you get reports without name, witnesses being named and that sort of thing it's a little bit uh, questionable you do have a very um very thorough very professional very credible uh, approach to writing in terms of setting out this is my source material this is where these people are i'm speculating on these points however i'm speculating because of you know these yeah these reasons this is where you know these people are and this is it's a it's a it's a more in depth, truthful police report way of 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 approaching these topics. I think it gives it way more credibility than some of the 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 more flight of fantasy approach that you see in nearly all other books, even from very reputable researchers. Um, yes. I could find your your approach to documenting the cases, yeah, very thorough, and 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 therefore I, I really like that. Oh, thank you very much. That's nice of you to say that. Yeah, I try to get that right because I, I, when I'm writing something like that, I'm, I'm, I, th I think, well, what sort of thing would I want to read? You know, and if I if I read something is documented, says what the sources are, and, and that kind of, you know, that's what I, I, I so that's what I try to do myself. And uh, but um, it's it's not easy, and you 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 can't win with some people. I mean, some people will criticise you because you've done a lot of comparing and contrasting what different authors have said and they say you've done no original research and I think they think original research is hanging around in a churchyard with a, a, a an audio recorder at midnight but I mean that might have a part to play in investigation and obviously I, it's nice to get to places and do on-site examinations but sometimes just comparing what's written about the thing is important and you can see the problems with the literature different claims don't match up and so on a case in point, actually, I, 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 it's a case I've sort of revisited recently, it, um, the alleged haunting of a place called Sandwood Bay. I don't know if you've heard of Sandwood Bay, up in the far northwest of Scotland. It's a very beautiful, wild bay, about nine miles, six miles, nine miles, I'd say, south-southwest of, John, of uh, Cape Roth. And there are various stories there about a ghostly sailor being seen on the beach in the bay and there's also it's now a ruin but there's a cottage called Sandwood it's you know it might be referred to as Sandwood Cottage uh, which is a ruin now it has, doesn't even have a roof left but in you know there were stories in the past of ghostly events occurring there and when you look at old books you know not not necessarily very old books there are lots of stories about it but um, in looking at the books and comparing and contrasting sources, there's very much a folklore theme to many of these stories and, 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 and discrepancies as well. And um, I mean, I found one case, uh, the, 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 one report about Sandwood Bay about a couple, I think a couple of people from Surrey who had been walking, doing a long walk across the moors and that sort of thing. And they decided to spend the night in the empty cottage and then they had a horrendous night, you know, all sorts of dramatic phenomena occurred and the place seemed to almost be coming apart at the walls at times and they left you know at first light and the first person they spoke to was a local postmaster and they told this person about the terrible time they'd had. Now I found in one of the sources it's a folklore book a report about a completely different area 
uh, told by a, a local shepherd um, called Sandy Gunn, and he he allegedly had a kind of really you know amazing ghostly experiences recurrently in a house in Glen Urquhart, miles from from Sandwood Bay, and when you look at the text, the description, you know, there's one section where it's the same stuff that's being reported so obviously i think what's happened is a folklore story pertaining to one place uh, which probably has very little credibility anyway has been trans translocated to this cottage um, and i i suspect that this sort of thing happens because the place has got that kind of wild romantic touch to it you know if it was somewhere in the black country or something an old foundry dingy old street you know not as romantic looking and wild it probably wouldn't may, maybe as attractive to the folklore kind of weavings and um so i think, I think that's probably what happened there but the, some of this stuff gets passed off as fact and you'll get writers maybe who some of the time will be quite critical and do proper investigations they'll just report a case like that without maybe saying what the source is you know and if you just read that case you might think oh this man's you know written these interesting case reports and now he's telling us at Sandwood Bay this couple had this odd experience and you might oh that's really that's really exciting you know but when you really start looking at the stuff comparing and contrasting again you see the problems a, a great example, actually, is at, at some years ago, I did some research with a chap called Alan Gould into claims, um, a couple of English phantom army cases. One of them, you, you probably heard of this one, Edge Hill. Uh, in 1642, the Battle of Edge Hill was the first major clash between the parliamentarian army and, and the royalist army in the Civil War. Um, and it was fought in, in near a place called Kyneton in Warwickshire. And according to a couple of pamphlets published just weeks or months after the battle, um, there were ghostly reenactments of the of the battle in the area. Um, and when I was young, I sort of saw, saw books on ghosts. This was reported as fact. And the story gets, gets better than that. The, the story goes that the king, who was at Oxford at the time, got to hear about these events and sent a delegation of men to look into the ghostly events and they happen to experience the, the events themselves. So a really dramatic story. And I saw this sort of repeated in these books. And I think what had happened was that authors assumed that either they couldn't be bothered to check or they just assumed that someone else had checked the facts at some point. But anyway, I, I, I did some research into this case with, with, with this colleague Alan Gould some years ago. And we found that we, we were unable to find any real corroboration. I mean, one of the claims in the pamphlets was that this, the minister in, in Kyneton at the time was a Samuel Marshall. But we discovered the vicar was a man called Richard Fisher. Uh, the pamphlets name some of the men who were involved in the Royal Commission that was sent to, supposedly sent to Kyneton. So we checked documentation about these particular individuals, historical records, and we couldn't find any reference to their having participated in a Royal Commission to investigate the ghosts. Uh, so we, we, you know, we found problems with it and we concluded that the stories may well be fictional. I'm not, I mean, I don't come at this as a sort of arch debunker who likes to kind of punch a hole in every claim of the paranormal. As I say, I, I do believe that these things do happen, but, you know, I, I really think we need to be careful about taking a lot of these stories at face value without looking cl closely at the evidence. Sure. I think debunking is, is just as important as verifying. It sometimes should be the first thing. I think it should always be the first approach is to try and not actively or vehemently, yes. but to, to try and disprove. And then when yes. you find you can't, okay, well then let's look at what the, yes. the unexplainable explanation is. There was one more thing I would like to talk to you about. Missing time. Yeah. Can you just briefly for the listener, it's, it's a, it's a real fascination point for myself personally, but just for everyone, can you just briefly summarize kind of what that is? And then I'd like to just quickly hear your thoughts on it. Right. Well, it, missing time is really a, 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 another way of describing amnesia, a period of forgetfulness. It's often used in the UFO context where people have had a close encounter. Um, and then after the close encounter, um, they notice inexplicably that it's much later 
or significantly later than they thought it was. Maybe the, the encounter occurred at nine o'clock and it was still light, it was the sun's evening. And then the encounter's over, they sort of come to in a sort of bit of a haze and it's now a lot later than they, and they can't really account for what's gone on. Um, so that's, that's how missing time tends to be used. Um, and um, it's in the UFO area, it's, it's sometimes assumed that the, the people have been abducted by aliens, um, maybe medical type procedures have been carried out on them, um, some, maybe something to do with reproduction um, or tests of some sort or other. Uh, and then the aliens have somehow through superior technology of some kind or a mental control have, have, have made people forget what's what's happened um, or it could be that the people's mind, own minds have kind of blanked out the thing because whatever happened was so frightening and traumatic uh, so that's the kind of the, the, the traditional UFO way, way, way of looking at it another approach is to think that some people have speculated that ambient magnetic fields may have affected the brain of the people involved and uh, caused them to have a memory blank and uh, and maybe to have hallucinations or to have false memories um, so uh, for what what's happened so if they recall maybe being taken into a spaceship or something like that some people would say that could be a physically real event that's being recorded. Others might say it was a hallucinatory kind of experience um, that they're recalling, not, not a physically real one. Although they might have marks on their body or things like that, which you know suggest something at least as physical has happened. It's interesting about memory uh, distortions because um, a common assumption with ghostly phenomena, apparitional phenomena, is that the person has seen or seen or witnessed something. And um, but it seems to me that it's quite possible that some apparition reports of ghosts and apparitions and so on are actually false memories rather than false perceptions. I mean, going back, for instance, to road ghosts. Imagine that I come, I turn up at a police station in a bit of a panic and I said I've just been driving along a gypsy lane and a woman ran out in front of my car and I thought I'd hit her and I got out and checked under the car and I couldn't find any sign of her and the policeman says okay well come with us we'll go back and we'll do a search so I go back with the police we search the area or they search the area thoroughly they can't find any sign of any woman you know lying in the hedgerow or anything like that and they check my car they find no dents or anything now in a case like that, the usual assumption is that my reporting the event to the police was based on a, a perceptual experience, my seeing something that in this case wasn't in a sense fully physically real. So I have a perception, I have a memory of what I've perceived, and then I report my perception to the police. But another possibility is that you're driving along and something in an instant manipulates your mind and inserts a false memory that you've just hit a woman and you're convinced by that memory it's real it's subjectively compelling so when you go to the police station and you report the event your 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 report is of course based on your memory of what happened which may not actually be a reflection of what truly happened so it seems to me that some of these cases we, we could be dealing with problems of memory distortion rather than perceptual experiences um, slightly off the subject maybe of missing time but it's sort of to do with memory i suppose sure no it's not off the topic at all and it's very much on the topic of of basically yeah. why i wanted to talk to you tonight which is to hear the thoughts of somebody who's worked within the field of psychology for i can give you a, a, a fascinating case i wish I'd, I'd made some sort of private notes of it you know this was years ago back in the 70s perhaps um i i had a patient who um She'd been, I think she would have been engaged or was, in, was close to being engaged, probably, let's say for the sake of argument, engaged um, uh, to a man who was sadly fatally injured in, a, in, a, in an accident, road traffic accident. And um, she somehow convinced herself, I say she convinced herself, but this is the conventional way of looking at it, I suppose, that he was still alive, that he was kind of making a slowish recovery in a, in a city hospital. And she, she also somehow convinced herself that she was going off to visit him periodically. 
Um, now to get from where she lived to the hospital and back would have probably involved a journey, maybe about, including the visiting time, say three hours or something. And she was actually apparently going, leaving a home for time like that every periodically. Um, and one day, I think this had been going on for, for months, and someone who knew the true circumstances, she mentioned her surviving fiance, and this person who knew the true circumstances said, but Sue or whatever her name was, Joe's dead, you know, and it kind of hit her, you know, what do you mean? And she was sort of forced to confront the fact that this was an illusion she'd be living under. But what was interesting about this woman was, as I recall, she seemed very normal. You know, I mean, she didn't seem psychotic or anything like that. She seemed quite pleasant and reasonable and so on. Um, and um, it was fascinating the way her, her mind or something at least had, uh, had, had warped her memories so radically. And I think she was a bit taken aback by that, you know, not just the fact that she had to come to terms with the fact that her fiancé wasn't alive, but the fact that her own memory had been so seriously awry. I tried using hypnosis to find out where where she'd been going, you know, when she was making these trips, wherever it was. But she didn't seem to be very responsive to that, so I didn't get very far with that. But but it was clinically, it was an interesting case, and it just highlighted, you know, you know, my goodness, if you can think that you're visiting someone in hospital and he's still alive and he's actually dead, you know. So what's um what are you working on next? We've done roads, forests. Do we have something in the pipeline? To be honest, I find, I, I, I find though, I, I, don't, I don't think it's getting worse. I find actually doing these kind of, this kind of research is very tiring. And there's always that kind of problem of, you know, you, it's easy to get things wrong. And it bugs me if I kind of get, you know, publish something and I notice a little error in it. And it's inevitable it's going to happen. You know, you're going to get something not quite right. But when it's, it's so fiddly, checking quotes, checking dates, making sure references are correct and so on. But it's worth doing because there are so many, I mean, I don't mean this disparagingly, but there are so many trashy books out there nowadays, aren't there, with so little research on, um, you know, you're lucky to get an index these days, aren't you? You know, and uh, it's not even it's not even easy to do some of the research. I mean, depending on what you're researching, but yeah. um, a, a guy I know who's been on the show, he's a fantastic researcher, Mike Cole, who works um, around the Yorkshire area, but he's written 30, 40 books on, on all sorts of things. Yeah. And he sits for hours contacting National Archives, trying to get his hands on it, it, certainly in the case of UFO phenomena and uh, trying to get his hands on redacted information and trying to find reports where certain certain parts haven't been redacted and then cross-referencing them and then trying to get back to the source material and you find out that that material actually relates to, and it can it t- takes his life life up you know and yeah that's very right. successful and writes fantastic books but to try and thoroughly research where you feel you've got right down to the very bottom and you're not making any mistakes yeah isn't just time consuming it's it's life for consuming you really need to commit to doing it don't you so yeah. so where can where can people find your books where can people follow your work well, if, they, if they're interested, they can probably find the easiest way, I suppose, that is Amazon, you know, just to, to, to go onto Amazon. That's, that's the, the one. I mean, they could go to the publishers, of course, but uh, um, that's an alternative. But uh, um, if, if they, 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 they just do a search for, for the titles. Um, the first one is called Zones of Strangeness, and it's subtitled uh, An Examination of Paranormal and UFO Hotspots. So the second one is um, Paranormal Encounters on Britain's Roads, Phantom Figures, UFOs and Missing Time. And the third one is called Britain's Paranormal Forests, Encounters in the Woods. It's been great to to hear about your work. Um, It's been great to pick your mind. It's been great to hear about um, the approach to something that I talk to people about all day. I listen to other people's shows, other people's podcasts. I read their books. And very rarely do I hear somebody who approaches something from the you know the background that you have which is um, which is what makes you such a fascinating person to speak to so thank you very very much for taking the time out of your evening apologies for doing it quite so late no that's okay um, yeah not at all been an absolute pleasure thank you very much
Appear Beyond the Veil has been written and presented by myself, Mark Watson, as part of the Fearscape Media Network. Music and soundtracks are credited and licensed to Purple Planet and to Kevin MacLeod, licensed under Creative Commons. All rights are reserved by our parent company, MLW Publishing. You can follow us at facebook.com forward slash peer beyond the veil or on Twitter at peer beyond the veil or at peer beyond 2020. Please click the like and subscribe buttons when you see them, most importantly, wherever you listen to your podcasts. It helps us to attract the attention we need to keep the show going, to get the guests that you all want to hear from, and to help more and more people 